Hi, I'm Matt Eland, and this is the history of .NET from its betas to present day as of early 2020. So once again, I am Matt Eland. I am Integer Man on Twitter. I tweet a lot about code and things like that. Uh, I'm also an instructor at a, at a uh, Eastern boot camp in the United States called Tech Elevator, uh, where I teach software engineering to uh, pr uh, aspiring programmers. Uh, before that, I had a long and successful career as a .NET developer, uh, ending as a software engineering manager where I ran all of .NET and some TypeScript for our organization. Uh, again, I've been working with .NET since beta 1 back in 2001, uh, but don't let that fool you. There's plenty of .NET that I don't know or don't know very well. Uh, but we'll be talking mostly about just all of .NET today. Uh, we'll get more into the objectives in a minute. Uh, I write frequently on software quality, software development, software engineering, teams, etc. on killalldefects.com if you want to check that out. If not, that's cool too. Uh, so today's kind of an interesting talk. We're going to be talking really chronologically about what .NET is and how it's changed over the years because it's changed quite a bit. Uh, we'll be talking about .NET Framework, uh, .NET Core, and then by extension .NET 5, uh, ASP.NET, uh, MVC, as well as some of the key languages and tools that we use. Uh, so Visual Studio is often accompanying new .NET versions, and we'll be talking about C Sharp, VB.NET, and F Sharp, and how those languages have changed over time as well. Um, and we can't really talk about .NET without talking about notable events in the industries and in related spaces that impact uh, the way that .NET works. Uh, so we'll be kind of covering this from 2002 onwards, and you, you'll see when we get into it. Uh, but really, that that's our, our, our goal. Um, now, why I want to do this is I want to highlight how .NET has changed, how Microsoft has changed, and how software development has changed in the years that I've been a professional developer. Um, and kind of under undercutting that is is how is .NET relevant today? Is it still relevant? Uh, and where is it going? Uh, so my hope for you in in watching this is I'm going to be hitting you with a lot of information. We're not going to be going getting deep into it, but I want you to see how things have changed and how Microsoft continues to improve and adapt these languages and these tools. Uh, so you have more of an understanding and appreciation for what we have today in 2020 because it's quite a rich environment. Uh, so, some disclaimers, uh, I am not affiliated with Microsoft, I've never worked for them, uh, I've never even been a, a, an MVP back when, when I was a developer, uh, I'm just a guy who happens to like .NET and .NET products, uh, as well as other technologies. Um, this is just my recollection of these releases over the last 20 years, uh, as well as what I've done to research this, but I've cast a fairly broad net. so some of this information may be lacking, it may be slightly inaccurate. Uh, Especially, specifically things around MVC, uh, where I haven't done a ton of work on the view layer, uh, may not be that accurate. Some of these uh, items, the dates are, are fairly approximate, especially when we get into the Visual Basic language, uh, because uh, the various documentation out there is, is, is missing or is just ballpark year and, and month. Um, but it should be roughly correct. Uh, because of the vast amount of quantities uh, of that we'll be covering today, I can't really get in, be, be getting into the details of individual things, uh, but I'll be giving you my um, uh, my perspective on how this was relevant and how this remains relevant or isn't relevant anymore for various things. And, and just finally, um, for those of you suffering with imposter syndrome, which includes myself, .NET is really, really big. It continues to grow. It's very broad. It's nearly impossible to know of everything inside of .NET. I'm gonna be talking to you today about stuff that I haven't worked with personally, stuff that's a little over my head, especially on the functional programming side where I'm still learning and growing. Uh, don't feel that you have to understand everything in order to work with .NET or call yourself a .NET developer. It's big, it's gonna keep getting bigger. That's okay. It, it's got stuff that will let you do what you need to do. Um, so, as I mentioned, I have kind of my own perspective on .NET, and, and as a result of that, what I'm talking to you about today is going to be influenced by that perspective. So I kind of came at .NET from a de desktop development background, uh, went through the WPF, Windows Phone, Silverlight development route. Uh, don't worry if those names don't mean anything to you. Uh, I'll go over them as they come up. Uh, then I kind of got into web API development, database development, and really became a full stack .NET developer. Uh, 
and finally morphing out into uh, JavaScript and TypeScript and uh, some of our front end development frameworks that are not, you know, uh, Microsoft based entirely. Um, so, uh, with that said, uh, let's uh, let's transition over into our, our our main presentation, which is going to be using a product called Git Kraken's uh, new timelines feature, which is in beta as of the time of this recording. Uh, but this should give us a nice visual way of kind of understanding .NET as it as it grows over the over the uh, the period that we'll be talking about. All right, so here we have uh, January fifteenth, uh, two thousand two. After several years of betas, uh, including beta two, which was my first exposure to .NET, uh, Microsoft officially released the framework. Um, and this, in order to understand .NET Framework, you need to understand the problems it was trying to solve. Uh, this was really initially branded as NGWS, which is Next Generation Windows Services. So it wasn't really intended to be cross-platform or anything uh, like it is today, but it was trying to solve this problem referred to as DLL Hell. Uh, a lot of stuff relied on COM, Component Object Model, and uh, getting the versions right and the dependencies right was a major pain for uh, the people who were in development uh, before I entered it professionally. And so .NET introduced something called the Global Assembly Cache, or the GAC, uh, to really manage a lot of these um, interoperability, uh, versioning, and things like that. Uh, it offered uh, web development through ASP.NET Web Forms, and it offered Windows and desktop development through WinForms, uh, console applications, and uh, Windows services. WinForms is Windows Forms, but uh, I commonly refer to as as uh, WinForms. Uh, so, when .NET came out, it had three languages associated with it that we'll be talking about today. It had C Sharp 1.0, brand new language styled on Java, uh, very similar, intended for those who, those who were coming from C++ or similar types of backgrounds like Turbo Pascal. Um, but if you were coming from a Visual Basic background, there was also Visual Basic.net, which here is referred to as VB7. Uh, so Visual Basic was intended sort of as the bridge to get people who were Visual Basic developers into .NET with the hope that they might branch into C Sharp. Uh, Visual Basic will continue to get updates, as we'll see over the course of this presentation. Uh, but much of the examples that you're going to find out there are going to be in C Sharp or even F Sharp now. Uh, and finally, there's this thing called J Sharp, which was intended as a bridge for people who are Java developers to help them get into uh, .NET development as well. Uh, we'll. We won't talk about that much except for when it, it uh, its end of life was announced. Um, so fast forward a month and uh, Visual Studio .NET is released. This is the initial version of Visual Studio that works with um, uh, the .NET framework. Uh, now beta versions of that were available before so people could use that uh, with the .NET framework when it came out, but the final non-beta version of Visual Studio .NET uh, didn't release until this time. Uh, so fast forward a year and Microsoft delivers a, uh, a, a service pack uh, for the framework as they do. Uh, typically just bug fixes and things like that. There's not a lot of details that survived on this one and it's not terribly relevant because uh, one hopes you're not out there doing .NET Framework 1 development at uh, 2020, but uh, you never know. Um, they followed it up half a year later with uh, another service pack. Uh, and then they started really improving it by adding in uh, the .NET Framework 1, which added in you know some additional ASP.NET uh, controls for mobile, uh, allowing Windows Forms to run in semi-trusted manner from the internet. I actually don't know a whole lot about that. That surprised me that you could do that. Um, added some security, database support, uh, IPv6 support, you know, the sort of maturity things that you would expect in a language that's, that's starting to grow and get usage for the first time. Uh, so next you see uh, Visual Studio .NET uh, 2003. This added, uh, you know, support for, for these innovations that just came out, but otherwise didn't change too much. There's probably a, a sizable number of uh, stability improvements. Um, Following that up, though, was Visual Basic 7.1, which added support for the new .NET Compact framework, which was for uh, uh, Windows Mobile, uh, the precursor to Windows Phone. Uh, and it also improved the, uh, the Visual Basic upgrade wizard for people taking the Visual Basic path into .NET. Um, there are a, a, a couple minor uh, C-sharp language upgrades. Uh, 
in October of 2003. There's not a lot of details on 1.1, but we know that 1.2 uh, added some uh, support for disposing uh, things that in, in rare circumstances weren't disposed before in a for each statement. Uh, .NET, uh, they continued to, to improve it with service packs. And then in May of 2005, F-Sharp 1 uh, was released. I don't remember a lot of fanfare about this. Uh, certainly there wasn't a lot of adoption around this. Uh, but the, you look at the initial features of this, which is more than just these five things here, uh, but it, it's a full functional programming language uh, in its infancy. Uh, and we'll see uh, F-Sharp continue to grow over the course of these releases. Um, but just for people who, who think that F-Sharp hasn't had a lot of support, it's been there since 2005 and it continues to get regular releases. It just doesn't necessarily get the attention that other languages have gotten because functional programming hasn't been as popular uh, in the last couple decades as it has been in the last five years or so. Uh, .NET Framework 2.0. This is one of my favorite um, releases of .NET. Uh, and not necessarily for the reasons listed here, though these are good reasons. Uh, it's really because it introduced C Sharp uh, 2, uh, which we'll talk about in a second here, and the things that that brought about. But .NET Framework 2 brought about some things that were, made it really possible to work with .NET in, in a uh, really production sense. Uh, we'll talk about that more that in a, in a minute here with C Sharp. So we add in generics. So list of T, for example, instead of having to explicitly cast everything and do boxing and unboxing all the time, and uh, you get partial static classes, anonymous methods, iterators and delegates. I can't even imagine .NET without delegates, but it, it, they were new in 2.0. Um, and then you get covariance and contravariance, which I can't even begin to get into in this uh, uh, large presentation here. But C Sharp 2 was one of the biggest releases of that language uh, and, and it made it possible to work with it. Uh, the only thing that really comes close to it in as far as the overall impact on developer productivity uh, from my recollection is when we got Link uh, later on, which we'll talk about with .NET Framework 3.5. Uh, but C Sharp 2 made it like, okay, uh, we can do this. This makes sense. Let's, let's get coding. Um, I, I really felt the impacts of this when it came out and, and I still I'm thankful for the generic type support that we have in the language today. Uh, so VB8 uh, added some things which I'm a little less wild about, uh, specifically the my namespace. I've seen a lot of evil things come out of the my namespace, but we did get the using keyword, which helps us make sure that we dispose uh, things properly, um, because awful things happen if we don't use the using statement. Um, and again, they're investing more in VB to VB.NET Converter. You see the, the focus here is still maturing the, the, the platform, helping developers get productive with it, helping developers get onto it. Uh, so we're still in the early adoption phase of .NET. Uh, so Visual Studio 2005 came out about the same time, and you know it enabled .NET uh, Framework 2.0. But it also added uh, you know, IIS Express, added ADO.net uh, and some web publishing improvements. So Visual Studio is starting to get better as a development environment um, and, and .NET's really starting to become viable at, at around 2005. Though you can certainly do some things, and I did some things before, uh, before that time. So uh, I think in order to understand programming, we need to understand other things that were going on during that time. So let's look at, look at 2005. So we have the initial launch of Xbox 360. Uh, the Unity game development platform launched actually in that time. I couldn't even remember that. And uh, uh, Torvalds created Git uh, during that time. And it took it a while to, to propagate to other places, but uh, you know, the rich version control that we enjoy today uh, came around uh, back in 2005, uh, which is pretty cool. So .NET Framework 3 was a big deal. Uh, this was really intended to be the four pillars of Vista. Uh, card space is not one of those four pillars. Uh, the fourth was the file system improvements, which was actually removed. Uh, but they have you know, Windows Presentation Foundation, which I'm still wild about to this day, even if not a lot of people like to do desktop development like me. Uh, there's WCF, so Windows Communication Foundation, uh, really improved a lot of um, 
uh, communication between uh, services and uh, servers and things like that. Uh, nowadays, I, I definitely try to avoid WCF and you just use REST or gRPC or something like that. But back in the day, it was very good for its robust uh, capabilities. And the Workflow Foundation is, is something that is more niche, and I haven't had a chance to really use that very much. Um, but for people working with workflows, uh, it can be helpful. Uh, I can't speak a lot to it. Card Space was more about identity and things like that. I can't remember if this this got canned or got merged into something else later on, uh, but apparently it was part of 3.0. Um, so Windows Vista was released to business at the end of uh, 2006, um, which surprised some people. Uh, we also released XNA in Microsoft did, uh, which is a very good .NET based uh, game development platform, uh, which is part of why I don't remember Unity being a thing, because XNA was, that was it if you were a .NET guy trying to do uh, game development without going into C++ or something like that. Uh, and we see AWS uh, MacBook Pro <laughs> uh, coming on the scene as early as 2006 and jQuery uh, came out. So you can start to see the seeds of what's uh, what's coming with uh, with uh, professional development at back as early as 2006, which is really incredible to go back and look at that. Uh, so C Sharp 3 uh, adds some pretty cool stuff. Um, these are a little bit different than anything we've seen before. Uh, this is because the language is starting to morph and adapt uh, to things that we want to do. Specifically, these things are all to support Link, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we have auto properties, so you know, get set uh, without explicit packing fields. That's a really a developer productivity improvement. Uh, and then anonymous types, query and lambda expressions, and extension methods, those are all needed for link. I believe in implicitly typed local vi variables helps link as well, but that's really the var keyword, so it's a little bit of a developer productivity as well. So C Sharp 3 helps developer productivity in very similar ways that, that C Sharp 2 did. Um, but it also gets the language into a, a more of a functional uh, way. And I just noticed a typo there with uh, Lambda expressions. That should definitely be expressions, not expressions. Sorry about that. Um, so we see some uh, some early service packs as well for uh, .NET Framework 2.0 and 3.0. And I think Microsoft is starting to feel the strain of supporting all these different versions of the framework uh, back as early as 2007. Um, and they, they shift gears in a few years after this point uh, to, to do this less frequently. Uh, but back then, they were still releasing service packs. Uh, .NET 3.5, as mentioned, has Link, which is huge. Uh, Link is one of those things that's just phenomenal for developers working with uh, collections. I do a lot of back-end development, uh, and so Link is very helpful for me for manipulating collections, for uh, finding things, for... Uh, transforming things, uh, etc. It's really a valuable uh, library, uh, and it's one of those things that, that shifts the way that you can do development in a way similar to generics did. Um, we see Compact Framework getting some improvements, Workflow, WCF also getting some improvements. And uh, Visual Studio 2008 came around to support these things. And this was actually really important because WPF and XAML required some drastic tooling changes from what Microsoft had before with Windows Forms. And so really a lot of this 2008 tooling is around WPF and XAML. But we also get code analysis and, and metrics, um, some better HTML CSS editors, which came around as a result of working on the, C the, the XAML editors, uh, workflow improvements, and then, you know, multi-threaded improvements, which is um, actually very helpful when you're doing <laughs> WPF or Silverlight development and things like that, because you do wind up working with a lot of threads. Um, so J Sharp, as I mentioned, did uh, go away, and it was announced that it would uh, it would die out uh, back in 2007. There were not a lot of people working with J Sharp that I saw, um, but uh, this was the death knoll for that. Uh, and then Windows Vista. Uh, was fairly memorably released to consumers, and it was not very well received. Uh, but the iPhone came out, and that was, and uh, Silverlight was released, and that was a pretty big deal. That was called WPF Everywhere back in the day, and that was just Windows Presentation Foundation 
Um, but it would work inside of a browser via a plugin system, which is really cool. It meant that you could use the same developer productivity uh, tooling and skills that you could with XAML and WPF and have it run in a browser. And so you have one code base that runs either in your desktop or in your browser. Um, and, and so that was really the promise that Silverlight offered. And it was very, very good for uh, high-end uh, productivity applications, uh, business applications, or media applications. So VP9 comes out. Um, there's not a lot of improvements here. Um, they do get some conditional things, uh, but really this is a lot of stuff just to support Link. Uh, and then I mentioned the service packs starting to die out. I believe these are the last service packs that we'll see, except for 1435, which we'll talk about in a minute, after this Microsoft sort of morphed things into a more of a, a point release strategy. Uh, so here's that, that, that that's SP1 I was mentioning. .NET Framework 3.5 SP1 was actually a pretty big deal. Uh, so WPF really was slow, especially if you didn't know how to use it right. And so these performance improvements really helped people adopt it and helped people excel at their applications and, and deal with the very real pains that they were having. Um, Entity Framework it was huge and remains huge. So Entity Framework is a productivity tool allowing you to talk to various databases uh, without really necessarily having to rely on the SQL uh, for that. And that's a, a, a technology that has grown in the last decade significantly, and it makes developers' lives a lot easier. Uh, and ADO.NET Data Services also came out at that time, so you can kind of see the commitment to uh, making things a little bit more excellent. Uh, I'm not sure if Entity Framework was initially scheduled for 3.5 and it got cut and moved to the service pack, um, which is potentially possible, but this release was actually a little bit bigger than the .NET 4.0, in my opinion, uh, which is crazy for a service pack. Um, other things, uh, Chrome launched and GitHub launched, so both things that would eventually have a pretty sizable amount of impact on the development landscape. Uh, in March of 2009, we get ASP.NET MVC 1, uh, and this is a model views consult controller is MVC, and this is a replacement for web forms. Uh, a lot of people were saying that doing web forms development, you couldn't really do test driven development. It wasn't really scalable. It didn't work too well in large teams. Um, you had to write a lot of fiddly code for uh, for manipulating the events on the page. And that was really because Web Forms was built around the same mentality as Windows Forms was, uh, which is you know, maybe not the most ideal for a request response system or dealing with these complex web events. Uh, and so you see this product come out and it's only going to mature over time and eventually it's going to surpa uh, surpass uh, Web Forms. And we'll see ASP.NET MVC really becoming the dominant way of, of doing a uh, a front-end development on the uh, on the web in the .NET platform. Um, we see Windows 7 um, and ECMAScript 5, or ES5, was released in this year. This is an important one because prior to this, for about a decade, you hadn't seen a whole lot of change in JavaScript at all. It was very hard to work with. It, it varied wildly by the browser, uh, and people generally didn't want to be seen as JavaScript developers. That's probably hard for people to imagine right now, but back in the day, it's like, oh yeah, I'm a .NET developer, or I'm a Java developer, and yeah, I, I will write a little bit of JavaScript to manipulate things in a form, but I really hate it. Uh, ECMAScript 5 really started to change this, and uh, ES6, as we'll talk about later, really changed this further. Um, but we also have the beginnings of, uh, of what became Xamarin iOS in 2009, and then Microsoft launched Bing uh, in 2009 as well. So 2010 brings us ASP.NET MVC 2, and this is where we started to get a lot more of the capabilities that we know in, in MVC today. We get areas, templated helpers, data annotations, client server validation, model validator uh, providers. So it's starting to get a little bit more robust and thought out. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, what it is today, but it's very capable by ASP.NET MVC2. Um, so people start to, to, to trend towards uh, this, this technology at this, at this point in time. 
So C Sharp 4 comes out. Um, it's got some improvements. Uh, it's not a lot. Uh, named optional par arguments is, is okay. Uh, a lot of this stuff is really just heady to get into. Um, but this is an okay release of C Sharp. It's just not something that's necessarily going to change the way that you approach .NET development like C Sharp 2 and C Sharp 3 did. Uh, VB10 comes out. Uh, VB10 improves things a little bit more, gets things a little bit more standard with C Sharp, and also uh, removes the needs for the underscore continuation character, which if you've ever done VB.NET development, you had put underscores at the end of every line if it was going to continue down to the next line. Didn't have to worry about casing, you did have to worry about underscores. Now you don't. Uh, so we also get F Sharp 2. And I don't remember hearing a, a peep about this back in 2010, but you got the sequence expressions and async programming, extension, array slicing. You get a lot of things that are really core to F Sharp working with collections of data. Uh, so you can start to see F Sharp starting to become the language it is today, uh, which is kind of cool looking back. Uh, .NET Framework 4, uh, this wasn't big. Uh, the main thing you got as a .NET developer is you get the uh, uh, parallel extensions for your language, so you can do multi-threaded a little bit easier uh, with that. You also got code contracts, uh, which never really caught on. Um, and then if you were doing some sort of uh, fancy operations and you need some complex data types, uh, .NET 4 gave you those. So Visual Studio 2010 um, was actually highly hyped as being rewritten in, from the ground up in WPF, just because Microsoft was really pushing WPF and Silverlight. Um, and this was also when Silverlight you know, really came out as a, as a technique that you could really use. So by this point, Silverlight's mature. It's got a lot of capabilities that WPF has, and Microsoft wants you to use it. Um, but we also get some cool stuff like reference highlighting, quick search, and the new help system. Uh, 2010 was very slow initially. Um, a lot of that was a re result of some of the slowness that WPF was still seeing back then. Some of the service packs improved the performance of this considerably, but on initial release it was fairly slow. Uh, we, we also saw Windows Phone 7 launch, uh, Azure, and AngularJS, not Angular 2, but AngularJS, as well as NuGet package management. Uh, launch. So a number of things that really impact a lot of things uh, down the road started in 2010. And we get MVC3, which maybe is one of the larger uh, changes uh, for MVC because we get the actual Razor View engine, which uh, changes how everyone writes their the view layer of an MVC app. Um, you also get um, more control over dependency resolution, uh, request validation, things like that. Um, I'm not an MVC expert. I can't really speak too much uh, to these, but these are all you know, fairly big deal. But that Razor View Engine is huge because it allowed the, allows the Razor, the Razor syntax when you're writing your markup, um, which is you know, pretty cool. Uh, Windows Phone continues to mature. We get the Mango release, which I've actually co-authored some articles in a book on this, which you can search me in Amazon. Don't buy the book because, uh, well, Windows Phone's dead. Spoilers. Uh, but Xamarin's not, and we see Xamarin officially get founded in that year. Um, and Xamarin Android comes out. So Xamarin is really one of those things that it lets you write code once and run it everywhere. You hear this a lot in programming, especially in .NET programming, because that's what we all want to do, is we want to write the code that works on the desktop and the phone and you know the, uh, the web page. Uh, that's what we all want to do. And Xamarin says, hey, write some markup over here, and it'll run on, on, on iOS, and it'll run on Android, it'll run wherever you want it to. And that's really the promise of Xamarin, and Xamarin has really matured a lot in the last decade uh, since it was founded. C-Sharp 5 comes out, um, and the main thing it brings to the table is async await support. So you can work a little easier with asynchronous code. Uh, you also get caller info attributes, which lets you know uh, the name of the method that called this. That doesn't sound like it'd be that useful, but it is useful for logging, and it's really useful for uh, XAML technologies, which need to notify 
on, on property changed. And really, async await could also be looked at as a as an improvement for uh, XAML, especially Silverlight, which forces you to be to use asynchronous operations. So C sharp five was wasn't huge, but if you're doing asynchronous programming, uh, it simplified things quite a bit for you. Uh, VB eleven also gives you async await, and it gives you some of that same uh, debugging support and some of the same support that, that C sharp has, as well as um, the global keyword, which helps you with uh, namespace resolution. F sharp three uh, brings in a lot more uh, capabilities that we had before in other languages uh, with link, um, but we also get some cool stuff like type providers, uh, CLI mutable, and then units of measure. You know, some of this stuff is a little over my head, but uh, I got to tell you, the type providers are pretty cool. All right, okay, so moving on to, to .NET four five. So we get Universal Windows Platform, or UWP. Uh, this is Microsoft's uh, Windows 8 or Metro style applications that run inside that Windows Store sort of a, a compartment inside of the operating system. Uh, we'll see in a minute we're talking about. This is really to help Windows 8 and help tablet computing um, just as the industry starts to morph a little bit more. Uh, when this came out, a lot of people said, hey, Windows Presentation Foundation is, is dead, right? This is a replacement. And Microsoft was kind of like, yeah, well, not really, but yes. Uh, and, and you'll see that's not really the case here. WPF is actually still quite alive and vibrant. And uh, honestly, it's supported in more places than UWP is at this point, which is pretty cool. Uh, we also get Managed Extensibility Framework, uh, which is really good for application developers. Uh, we get ASP.NET improvements, Signal R, which is really good for making rich internet applications that get notifications from a server. It's kind of like a event publishing system, um, which is really cool. And we get some new features inside the system net HTTP uh, namespace um, in, in ASP.NET. So MVC4 gives us template improvements, OAuths, OpenID, um, async controllers, tasks. Uh, as well as just some general flexibility and maturity perspectives. Uh, th this isn't necessarily groundbreaking, but it does help with productivity, especially if you're trying to manage external identity providers. Visual Studio 2012, uh, this one was kind of panned. Uh, it was mostly uh, focused on C++ improvements, um, which I'm really not talking about too much at all in this video, um, which is unfortunate for you if you're a C++ developer. Uh, but I've not touched the language in 30 years, so sorry. Uh, we get uh, Windows RT uh, support inside of this, and uh, people just didn't like the user interface. <laughs> it's, it's weird, uh, but you look for, for feedback on Visual Studio 2012 from this year, and you're going to find a lot of people griping about the user interface and the all caps and the tabs, which they fixed in a registry setting and then later in a menu setting in 2013. But it's a little bizarre to see people freaking out over that. Uh, <laughs> um, as mentioned, we get Windows 8, we get the Surface, um, and then Microsoft announces this new language called TypeScript, uh, which I'm a huge fan of. We'll talk a little bit more about that once it gets released uh, a few years from where we are right now. Um, we get Xamarin Mac, uh, which makes sense. You know, write once, run everywhere. All right, VB12. Not a lot out there on this other than it supported 4.5.1 and 4.5.2. Okay. F sharp 3.1. Not a lot going on here, but some improvements. And we get .NET 4 framework 4.5.1, <coughs> which I actually I don't have a lot on this at all, which is interesting. Um, this may have been a um, security and performance and bug fix type of release, uh, but it is one of those minor point releases, as we mentioned before, which kind of replaces the service packs. Uh, Visual Studio 2013 gives us peak definition support inside the editor. Um, we can also do Windows 8.1 app development, um, get some better editors for ASP.NET projects. Office 365 support, and then if you're doing a lot of things involving memory dumps, uh, it can really help you out quite a bit. I remember trying to do memory dumps back in probably 2008, and it was rough. So that is 
much appreciated. Uh, ASP.NET MVC 5 this is the last major version of ASP.NET MVC uh, prior to .NET Core. But here's where we start to get into a lot of the, a, uh, the web APIs ty type of stuff, where you get attribute-based routing, uh, route constraints and prefixes, filters, filter overrides, as well as we get like the new scaffolding features, which lets you really quickly build out new pages based on entities, based on classes, based on things like that. So developer productivity, web API improvements, and uh, just better routing in general, as well as um, really embracing that shift that we saw earlier into external identity providers for people who don't want to have to manage their own identities of, uh, of users. So you want to use the Google profile or Facebook profile? Cool, have at it. Uh, ASP.NET MVC 5 helped you do that a little bit easier. Uh, so we also saw Windows Phone 7, 8, and 8.0. Uh, Docker came out, and React came out, and uh, a few other things as well, uh, which is pretty cool. So .NET Framework 4.5.2, uh, we have you know high DPI support. You're going to see that a lot more in some of these new, uh, some of these these newer frameworks coming out uh, soon. This is this is really just due to tablet computer support. This is due to uh, things like that. So services in general uh, and other similar devices. Um, we get some header manipulation for ASP.NET. We also get a Q background work item, uh, which helps for asynchronous programming inside of ASP.NET as well. So minor improvement, but it helped some people. Uh, we also get Windows Phone 8.1 and Vue, which is pretty cool. I thought Vue was, was a lot newer than 2014, um, but uh, Vue actually came out in 2014, or the initial version did. And Satya Nadella, uh, become CEO of Microsoft in place of uh, Steve Ballmer. Uh, this is huge. Uh, this really starts to mark a shift in thinking for Microsoft. So after this point, you see Microsoft start to embrace open source a lot more. Uh, that's really evident in .NET Core. It's, uh, it's evident in their interactions in GitHub and things like that. Uh, and it really starts to this is in part due to Windows 8, and this is in part due to the leadership change, where you see Microsoft saying, like, hey, all the strategy we're trying with the tiles and competing with Apple and trying to out Apple Apple, it, it's not working. We need to really just embrace the open web and the open ecosystem and just help developers do the things they want to do in the way that they want, they want to do them and not necessarily force them into the sandbox we want them to play in. Uh, and so Microsoft really starts to change significantly after this point, which is cool. Um, related to that, we see Visual Studio Code come out. This is continually updated, still gets updates to this date. Uh, it runs on Mac and Windows, uh, maybe Linux as well, I'm not certain. Uh, it's free, uh, very extensible, and it's so extensible that they have so many language platforms out there that you can do um, any sort of development you want almost in Visual Studio Code if the tooling is open and uh, and available for it. Uh, so a lot of people use Visual Studio Code for JavaScript or TypeScript development and they don't even touch .NET. Uh, it's just a good IDE uh, and it continues to get updates uh, to this day which is great. So C Sharp 6. Um, this is where C Sharp starts to change a little bit more. So you look at this and almost all of this is starting to shift us into functional programming, um, especially expressive bo expression bodied members. You start to, to, to see C Sharp become a lot more concise, become a lot more conscious of uh, quality issues that can, can arise from verbose code and things like that. So this, this starts to get exciting and, and you start to see the functional programming trends that are starting around this time to impact C Sharp. Um, VB, for whatever reason, they seem to have skipped uh, version 13. Um, this is a very minor update. We get string interpolation and no coalescing. Um, you're going to start to see VB getting a lot less love and F sharp starting to get a lot more love. Um, and that's because VB was probably intended not to last as long as C sharp did. Uh, and, and, you know, you look at the YouTube stats, and most people use C sharp. 
and f sharp starting to come up on that curve. I'm not sure where it relates to with VB, um, but I know most of the people I talk to would rather take an f sharp job than a VB.net job at this moment. I don't think that's a coincidence. Speaking of f sharp, um, we continue to get more and more capabilities. This isn't huge, but you know, little things help, and little things help and add up over time. Uh, .NET 4.6, um, this one, you know, it, it wasn't huge, but it adds uh, Ryujit, uh, so just in time. Uh, so this is a faster performance improvements uh, during runtime. So it, it uh, it's a little bit more efficient when uh, uh, doing its, its just in time compilation on things, especially on the first run. And we also get, again, high DPA capability, uh, additional uh, cryptography and then TLS 1.1 and 1.2 support. So really a quality of life uh, uh, release. Uh, Visual Studio 2015 adds Roslyn, which is the new compilation engine uh, related to RioJIT, uh, as well as ASP.NET 5, uh, and we get to Apache Cordova support. The, the big ticket item here is Roslyn compiler and all the refactorings and code analysis support that came with this. Um, which is huge for people that use it. Uh, I have been a ReSharper developer for, I don't know, uh, probably since about 2008 or so. Um, and so this was a lot of work for Visual Studio to get the capabilities in that in that product or some of those capabilities. And it tended to slow other things down because add-ons had to do a lot more work in order to get the information they needed. Um, so Visual Studio starts to slow down a little bit if you're using it heavily uh, with a lot of extensions at this point. Uh, but for everyone else, it gets more capable, which is really what they were going after. Uh, 461, uh, another little quality of life improvements, spell check, touch improvements, uh, security certificates, and then some improvements for Azure, Azure SQL as well. So 2015, uh, we saw the beginning of Windows 10 and then the end of Silverlight. Uh, so Chrome says, hey, we're done with this plugin model. Uh, we're going to deprecate it. It's gone. And so that forced people like me who had invested a lot of uh, development into Silverlight to say, OK, we need something else. Well, thankfully, Angular 2 launched that same year. And uh, ECMAScript 6 uh, helped, helped things quite a bit. Um, ECMAScript 6 or ES6, uh, this this is the version of JavaScript that really makes a lot of our modern frameworks possible and effective because it adds a lot of modern programming capabilities and makes JavaScript more into a more robust and well-rounded language than it is today. Um, this is probably the biggest change in JavaScript that we've seen uh, over the course of, well, this video, but my career as well. Uh, and then we also hear about WebAssembly and how that's coming out. Um, and that's really started to change things a lot in the last few years, which is pretty cool too. Uh, so .NET Core 1, uh, this is a big deal. It's been in the works for a little while. Um, and this is Microsoft saying, look, we're done with .NET Framework. We know we did some things wrong there. We need know things were a little slower in some places, but we can't really fix it or it'll break a lot of people who are relying on the timing. Uh, we know there's some quality issues in some areas. We can't fix it because people are relying on the current behavior. So here's a do-over. We're going to do this open source. We're going to do this bit by bit. We're going to do it as fast, uh, make it as fast as we can. We're going to make it as good as we can. Uh, and we're going to make it cross-platform. Um, so .NET Core 1 comes out, and it's limited in what it can do. But it's the start of the new version of .NET, which is the future of .NET, which we'll be talking about a little bit more. Uh, so .NET Framework 4.6.2, um, this one is another maintenance upgrade. So TLS 1.1, 1.2, uh, we get some uh, data annotation localization support. Uh, we get some DPI support in, uh, in certain applications. <laughs> we get support for paths longer than 260 characters, which you wouldn't think that'd be that long. But uh, uh, if you're actually developing locally and you're, if you pull folders deep, it can be an issue. Uh, and then we get some more improvements with uh, X509 certificates. Um, so ASP.NET Core MVC1 uh, is our initial version of MVC 4.NET Core. Um, so WebForms is not supported in this version of ASP.NET Core, uh, and it will not be supported. 
So that's not going to change in any of these future releases past 2016 that we'll talk about uh, today. So just if you're doing .NET Core, just know you cannot do web forms. Sorry. .NET Core 1.1 improves its performance, uh, and now we can also do EF Core with Azure and SQL 2016, which is pretty cool too. Uh, .NET Core uh, MVC 1.1. Uh, this is where it starts to get interesting. So we start to get into middleware here, where we get uh, URL rewriting, response caching, and then using filters. Middleware is what just kind of plugs together in MVC core as you're getting a, a request and, and having that request go to the server and then back out to the the client. Um, so you can kind of use middleware to, cut, to plug into things in a very streamlined uh, fashion. You also get Azure Key Vault for managing secrets and then WebSocket support too. So uh, MVC is starting to get a lot more mature at this case, uh, and, and it's really starting to become usable, which is nice. Um, you also get TypeScript 1.1 uh, in 2016. So TypeScript is just uh, statically typed JavaScript, or statically typed TypeScript that compiles down to, uh, to JavaScript. Um, I am a huge fan of TypeScript because I believe that its penalties um, in extra time specifying the types are worth it in catching issues, which the end user would find. Um, but that's a personal preference. Uh, so in 2016, Xamarin is acquired by Microsoft, uh, and we'll see a lot of changes in Xamarin um, as a result of that acquisition. Uh, but uh, Microsoft says, you know what, I, I, we really like what you're doing there with the right ones run everywhere um, using our XAML technologies. Uh, we're going to acquire you, we're going to remove the, the payment requirement for this, and we're going to make you part of our stack. And that's what they did. Uh, so C-Sharp 7 um, adds in a lot more functional programming things. So we get pattern matching, tuples, deconstruction, local functions, expression body getters and setters, uh, constructors, finalizers, things like that. So C-Sharp 7 is all about functional programming support. Um, and it shows. It's it's really cool. And by this point, you know, functional programming in the .NET world is starting to catch on. F# -sharp's starting to catch on a little bit at this point. It's hard to believe that they started in 2005, uh, 2005 and you know, over 10 years later, it's it's actually starting to catch on. <laughs> but uh, they kept with it, and uh, I'm glad they did because it's an awesome language to work with. Um, again, Visual Basic doesn't get a whole lot of love, um, and it's just hey. Here's some ways of improving your factoring. F sharp, however, is getting a lot more improvements. So we're seeing um, more interop uh, as of this release. Uh, better development developer experience via better error messages. Um, you're seeing more standards in working with C sharp and .NET in general. Uh, and so with 4.1, F-sharp really starts to become viable as a .NET programming language in the .NET environment. So you could write a library in F-sharp and use it from your C-sharp or VB.NET code. Uh, and it becomes less of a conceptual language and more of something that you can actually go and work with, which is cool. Um, Visual Studio 2017 was the first version of Visual Studio to support Mac, which is cool. Uh, lets you work with .NET Core, uh, Docker, uh, it's got a new editor config uh, property, which lets you kind of standardize the way that v various people on your teams are using uh, the Visual Studio editor, if you want. Um, and then it's just got some generic uh, productivity improvements as far as uh, just how you work with the code. Uh, .NET Framework 4.7 uh, comes out at about this time. Also has TLS support improvements. New print APIs, new security uh, style support. The new print APIs it doesn't sound like a big deal, but it actually was pretty sizable. Um, I, I had uh, I had some issues with printing uh, at the time, and these these APIs helped me out quite a bit to give the uh, the printing experience that our customers expected of us, uh, which was great. So happy to be supported by Microsoft and things that they they do. So C sharp seven one, not a lot of improvements. It's just more incremental. Like hey. Uh, you're doing this functional programming thing, that's great. Here's a couple more improvements you can make. MVC 2.0, MVC Core 2.0, um, add support for .NET Standard, uh, Razor Pages, 
you know, some better templates for uh, single page applications. So Angular, React, Vue, things like that. Um, the Kestrel web server got some improvements and we got some uh, improved HTTP header support. Uh, .NET Core 2, again, performance improvements. Entity Framework Core 2.0 comes out, uh, which is great. And .NET Standard 2.0 comes out. Uh, .NET Standard 2.0 is fantastic if you want to write code and have it be used by .NET Framework or .NET Core. Um, it's really what I would recommend for class libraries at this time. Uh, we have .NET Standard 2.1 uh, as of 2020, but for backward compatibility, I do recommend 2.0 uh, at this time still, just because uh, the ability for people still on .NET Framework, which is a pretty sizable amount of the community, uh, to be able to use .NET standard libraries is, is huge. Um, .NET Framework 4.7.1 comes out and adds .NET standard support. C Sharp 7.2, you know, more of the same. We're just making some more incremental improvements uh, based on the community's exposure to functional programming, the things that we find that we've needed, um, which is cool. You like to see things get improved over time. Uh, not a lot of details in 472, I believe it's just security uh, improvements uh, and performance improvements, uh, which is what you'd expect from a 0.2 release. So 7.3, um, same sort of a thing. Uh, this is getting more into memory management and passing things by references. Uh, but just additional specific scenarios that we're, that we're tweaking, not huge changes to the language. Uh, .NET Core 2.1 is a big deal. Um, so performance improvements are, are big, uh, but you can also start deploying things as NuGet packages inside of Visual Studio. Uh, you get the span T, so generic, being able to work with memory spans, uh, and then you get some uh, cryptography and compression APIs, um, and then some additional Windows compa uh, compatibility APIs. Um, ASP.NET Core MVC 2.1, that was pretty cool. Uh, we get Signal R in ASP.NET Core, which is nice. I'm a big fan of Signal R. And we also get Razor class libraries, HPS, GDPR uh, support inside of uh, the server itself. And we get API controller and action result T. So the language is starting to get more and more of the capabilities that we had in .NET Framework. It's becoming more and more viable. And about this time, you start to see things really start to embrace .NET Core and, and show up in that environment. Um, F Sharp 4.5, you know, again, we're getting a, some of the same features that we had in other languages because F Sharp is, is really up to speed by this point in time, which is cool. So we get span T. Um, little tweaks just for interop and things like that, um, but it's really coming come a long way, and it's it, the need for changes is is lessened. Uh, so .NET Core two two gives us a really better developer experience as far as diagnostics, uh, as well as some additional niche supports for uh, for certain scenarios. Uh, MVC two two gives us Open API, HTTP two endpoint routing, diagnostic and cores improvements. Uh, so this is a really solid release as well. Uh, the last one in the series was good too, but this is pretty solid. Um, so things are going pretty well. Um, in 2018, we see a new challenger appear in the uh, mobile space, and this is the Uno platform. Uh, so Uno is is uh, built on top of Xamarin, and it says, hey, we'll let you do Xamarin, but we're gonna let you use WPF style XAML or UWP style XAML if you want. So you don't have to learn a new dialect of XAML, uh, which is the Xamarin XAML. Uh, sorry, tongue twisters here. Uh, and additionally, Uno eventually says like, hey, this WebAssembly thing is pretty cool. We'll let you write your, your XAML. We'll let you run in Android and Windows and iOS, but we're also gonna let it run in WebAssembly in the browser. And that's something that they're really getting into um, in early 2020, uh, which is pretty cool too. So that's something to watch as well as the Uno platform. So Visual Studio 2019 comes out uh, last year in 2019, as you would expect. Also has Mac support, but it lets you work with .NET Core 3. Uh, the C Sharp editor was improved a little bit, and then we also get improved Xamarin and Unity tooling. .NET Framework 4.8, uh, this is not a huge one, uh, but we get some high resolution display improvements as we have like the last few framework versions 
Uh, we get some sec uh, some security and performance improvements as well. Uh, and this is really sort of getting into like our long-term support for .NET. We're not making a lot of changes to the .NET framework anymore. We're just really making things a little bit better uh, while people move on to .NET Core. So C Sharp 8 gives us um, a lot more functional syntax. So we start to see the improvements that have been made in the F Sharp side start to bleed into the C Sharp side a little bit more. Uh, making C Sharp a little bit more functional, a little bit more concise. Uh, harder for beginners to understand, but more capable for people who want to do functional programming inside the C-sharp language. Uh, VB16, again, they're just they're just staying afloat at this point. If you're still on VB, we want to give you the stuff that lets you work with the stuff that you want to work with, but uh, you really probably should get onto another language. And then F-sharp 4.7 is our current version of F-sharp. Um, this you know, some incremental improvements. Uh, it's hard for me to evaluate this one because this is really where I started getting deep into F Sharp was with F Sharp 4.7. Um, just making things better for developers, not a lot of huge changes. And then uh, .NET Core 3 comes out and we add Windows Forms and WPF into .NET Core uh, if you're running on the Windows platform. Uh, that is, don't, don't get thinking that you're gonna be able to run this on Mac today uh, but you know you start to get better uh, and we also get server-side blazer which is pretty cool so this is um, using WebAssembly or it's preparing to use WebAssembly but this is this is really the the shape of things to come as far as uh, an improvement on the razor syntax is the the blazer syntax uh, or the, the blazer applications uh, which really let you do a lot of deep application development when we get into client-side blazer uh, which is uh, possible now in, in, in early 2020. Uh, so MVC3 gives us again Blazor server, uh, and then we get Blazor WebAssembly. Uh, so this is uh, .NET DLLs that run inside your browser. Uh, and it's really it's that sort of rich applica internet application sort of thing, where you're writing C Sharp that generates a DLL that gets downloaded to the user's browser in a secure fashion. And then it gets interpreted uh, by JavaScript uh, into WebAssembly, and you can use that to communicate with your browser. It's a way of doing client-side development uh, without relying a lot on JavaScript logic, if that's what you want to do, which is what WebAssembly's job is. Um, we also get gRPC support, uh, JSON serialization improvements, and then perf uh, performance improvements. .NET Core 3.1, not a lot of changes, but this is our, our long-term support version for the next three years. So if you're doing .NET Core, you want to get on 3.1. Uh, and then early 2020, we got uh, MVC 3.1, which gives us you know, our, our client-side Blazor, um, as well as a lot of Razor improvements, uh, Blazor uh, development experience uh, improvements, etc. So you start to see Blazor becoming a more and more mature uh, technology in early uh, in early 2020. Uh, I think it's still got a little bit of work to do, but there's some very awesome, very passionate people around there who are saying that Blazor is ready. It's ready for you to adopt, and I'd encourage you to do some searching and um, hear what they have to say because it's exciting. Uh, and then finally, uh, the rest of where we're going with 2015 or 2020, uh, we're going to see .NET 5 come out, which is really a rebranded .NET Core, um, which makes it clear that this is .NET going forward. We will give you security updates for four, the 4.8 for the series. We will help you along, but this is where the future is. You need to get to this. You need to start on this for new projects. Um, so that's really where .NET is going. Um, going forward, and so that was uh, that's really our timeline. As you can see, it was a long uh, voyage, uh, but there are some common themes that we see. Um, we see .NET adapting to changing times. Uh, we see consumer technologies like the, the iPhone, Windows Phone, uh, tablet devices, iPad, uh, all impact development quite a bit. Uh, and .NET adapt to that. Uh, maybe not perfectly, but it adapted. Uh, you see the, my, the rise of modern JavaScript and how that has enabled single-page application frameworks. Uh, 
which .NET supports, you know, via its templates. Yeah, uh, I love .NET as a server, uh, an API server and database uh, manager for uh, front-end JavaScript. Uh, you see the rise of cloud computing via AWS and Azure and things like that. And you also see um, just open source becoming more and more of a thing, um, which is really exciting as well. Uh, and, and .NET has changed quite a bit from being a replacement for COM on Windows, <laughs> uh, where it's now running you know, uh, often on Linux uh, in .NET Core, and it's doing things that it really was never intended to originally, uh, and it's starting to become more and more functional oriented, uh, which is, uh, I don't, it, it makes me smile. It makes me very happy to see .NET adapting and changing and growing uh, in the way that it has and know that it's going to continue to do that over the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, I'm excited to see it. Uh, so once again, thank you for watching. Uh, I hope you've gotten something out of this, this little history lesson. Uh, I know it's not perfect because I don't know everything and I don't expect me to learn everything, but uh, .NET has something for everyone and there's always something to learn. There's always something new. There's always something to explore and it's a framework that really helps you grow. It really helps you do what you want to do. And that's, that's why I love it. Um, so please follow me on on, Integer, uh, on Twitter at IntegerMan. Uh, check out KillAllDefects.com. Uh, subscribe to this video if you liked it. Um, I'd love to hear what you think uh, as far as the future of .NET. I know it's not for everybody, but what excites you about where .NET's going, about C Sharp, F Sharp, even VB.NET, uh, or, or many, many of the things that I might have glossed over? Um, Hope you got something out of it, and uh, once again, I've been Matt Eland, so thank you for your time.